So a couple of weeks ago, in Uvalde, Texas, they gathered after the devastation that took place that ripped that community apart at Robb Elementary School. They gathered in a, in a rodeo kind of arena. The whole town, I think it was about 15,000 people or so. Thousands gathered to mourn, to hug each other, to be together. And at the end of that prayer vigil where pastors spoke and leaders, different ones, brought hope, there's a singular song that was chosen to end the time together by a violinist who stepped to the center of the stage and played that song, Amazing Grace. Because when there are no words, when we don't have answers, when doubt creeps in and we wonder where God is, maybe, just maybe, we can rest in the hope and believe and trust that it's true, that there really is grace, that there really is a God who loves us. That song written by a former slave trader whose life was transformed and later in his years, as he was struggling with dementia and an ability to remember things, he, he says this, I don't, I don't remember much, but I remember two things. I am a great sinner, and Christ is a great Savior. Friends, it's been a hard few weeks. And, you know, as we've tried to get our minds around what took place in Uvalde, and do you realize there's been 20 mass shootings since Uvalde in our country? And just this week, I talked to one of our members on Friday whose family members with the five who were killed by the escaped convict in Central Texas this week. And then last night to talk to another who, who's lost a spouse. And, and on and on it goes. And you know, as a pastor, I guess for so many years, you would think I, you know, kind of get used to it. Nothing surprises me now. Heard about another, you know, scandal in another church. And, and, you, and I just, I've always thought, well, just about anything that can go wrong in the church is going to probably go wrong. But the past few weeks, I'm just going to be honest with my church family. It's been hard. And y'all know that I've, I mean, I've been trained theologically. I'm, you know, I'm an apologist. I'm trained to have answers. I don't have any answers for this. Sometimes there aren't any answers. So what do you do when there aren't any answers? What do you do when, when what takes place in the world makes no sense at all? I mean, you talk to this sweet family member and she's saying, why, why did he have to kill them? Why? I have no answers. Sometimes all you can do is offer presence and prayer. And even there, a lot of people, and, and I get it, like, okay, prayer, stop. Let's end the praying, end the moments of silence. Let's do something. And I get that. This is true in all areas of life. We always say, you, you can't do more than pray until you've prayed. So we pray because we believe in the power of prayer. But here's what no one is talking about. There is evil in the world. There are demonic forces at work. How else do you explain this kind of evil that's taking place in our world? In some ways, it shouldn't shake us. It should confirm what we already know. I mean, we're heading to Africa where many people frame everything that's happening from the spiritual realm. Of course there's evil in the world. How else would you explain this? I've been to places, that, I've been to Africa, India, I've been to West Africa, South Africa, I've been to the Middle East. I've been to places, South America. I've seen demonic possession. I've seen this stuff. Stuff up close and personal. And you say, well, how come we don't see it here so much? Because we think, well, that guy just needed more education, evidently. 
We need better legislation. We need policies that are going to help this kind of thing. That'll fix it. Because now everybody is now debating about what went wrong, what could have happened, and how we can end this kind of thing. And yes, we need to do more than pray. So, so if your, your thing is, you know, mental health, that is a real, that's a real thing. Do something. If you say, we need, we need gun reforms, what we need, we need fewer guns. If that's your, do something. We, we need to do something. We need to act against this evil. How do we push back the evil? By sharing the gospel with every person that you know. That's how. That's how we change the world. Do you know this? One person at a time. This 18-year-old, he needed someone to come alongside him and let him know he's not alone, that he's loved. And we all know people that just need to be loved. But what do you do when your faith faces opposition? Because my faith has been facing some opposition. What do you do when, when doubt creeps in and you wonder, what do I do with this? Can I, can I even have faith and still have doubt and as we'll discover today yes you can in fact doubt is a part of any thinking person anyone who's thinking and wrestling with the stuff of life you're going to doubt we say it this way temptation is to sin as doubt is to unbelief you're going to be tempted and often we think i'm being tempted oops next step sin no 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 you're being tempted now new levels of obedience you're going to doubt. Any thinking person is going to doubt. Don't let your doubt become unbelief. How does that happen? That's what we're going to talk about today. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 15. We're going to look at an amazing, confounding story of a woman who is facing opposition at every step of the way to believe. And we're going to watch her story and how Jesus deals with her and I'm believing this message is going to change your life. I've already talked and prayed with some after our first service who heard the Spirit of God speaking to them through this passage. Because listen, at some point, your faith will be met with opposition. And oftentimes what happens is when that takes place, we feel like we're an outsider. Because even coming here today is a real challenge for some of you. Because here's what's happening privately. I know this is true. Some of us are here today and we're going, I don't even know if I believe all this. I mean, I love the songs. That was amazing. Bagpipes. This is, this is incredible. I just, but I, and I love, but I, I've got a lot of questions. You've come to the right place. This is a safe place to ask some dangerous questions. And what we're going to see today is that real faith acknowledges opposition. We don't, we don't put our head in the sand. We don't run from challenges. We face it head on. Real faith endures opposition. And real faith overcomes opposition. And this is what I want you to see today. And I want you to consider roadblocks that you have to faith right now. Because it's possible to think we come and worship and people are singing to the Lord. And we're all, you know, kind of dressed up. Look like we got it all together. And you're thinking, I feel like an outsider. Because I, I don't know. That I fit in here because I got a lot of questions look at verse 21 chapter 15 and Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon now place it in context this context historical understanding here in this passage is critically important it's, it's, it's true always but especially here so he's gone he was in Galilee and uh, there's some religious leaders from Jerusalem who's actually come from Jerusalem to Galilee. They're tracking him down. They're hounding him. They're coming after him now. He retreats. It says he intentionally withdrew. He goes up to what would be, if you know a map, it's going to be at the, at the uh, northwest of Galilee, about 40 miles. He's right at the coast there. And in, in Mark's gospel, we, we know more about this story than here in Matthew. He says that he's in a house. He's kind of retreating. He's with his disciples. He goes up there and behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. Now, this is interesting. Matthew is writing to Jewish people and he uses a word here, a singular word that's nowhere else in the New Testament to describe this woman. Canaanite. 
And you'd say, well, that, that's pretty common. They Canaanite. But no, here's, what, here's what's happening. This would conjure up in the minds of every person who's listening to this, reading this. The, this is the oldest, longest enemies of Israel, who the Canaanites are. It's, a, it's an Old Testament term. This is kind of, this is, it's a derogatory old school term. It's not unlike maybe people in the South calling somebody in the Northeast a Yankee, right? Draws back even from kind of Civil War days and you people up there and us down here. But this is a bit deeper than this. This, this is saying, these are, she was one of those. She's an outsider, okay? And the first thing I want you to see here, if you take notes, three things I want you to see. First, faith acknowledges opposition. Matthew doesn't, doesn't you know, he didn't, he didn't shy away from any of this. And this woman is going to face opposition like nobody's business. Uh, in fact, we'll see here that, that faith is not burying your head in the sand, like I said. It's not running or ignoring real problems. It's not a, a hopeless optimism. I mean, I mean like, a, like just this hopelessly optimistic kind of, kind of posture. It's acknowledging reality and all of the opposition that comes with that reality. So we need to head headlong face our challenges when you have doubts keep pressing on keep pressing in so what does this woman do well you see here right away she brings it to Jesus now this may be the last thing that you want to you want to do but I'm telling you with your doubts keep pressing into Jesus don't give up keep coming to him consider the barriers this woman had first she's a woman sorry but she's coming then to a man and to a rabbi to talk to him. Clearly she's an outsider. She's a Canaanite. She's a pagan. She's not a Jew. And then she said, Mark says she falls on her knees and she says, have mercy on me. Oh Lord, she calls him. Then she gives him the messianic designation. Son of David. She knows something. She has seen him. She's heard him. She has come to him. She is bold because she believes that Jesus somehow is the answer that he's the one who can heal her daughter consider the barriers to her opposition if you think you've got barriers uh, that, that, that are op op opposing you in regard to your faith consider the barriers the opposition that she faces cultural barriers religious barriers ethnic barriers social barriers racial barriers I mean, it's a completely different worldview. And she's coming here. Matthew doesn't dismiss any of this because sometimes our faith faces opposition. We acknowledge that I've got some struggles. Some of us need to do this. This is a place. Our church is a place where you can ask all the questions. She has a million reasons not to come to Jesus. She has a million reasons not to believe. We all encounter opposition to our faith. And when we do, what do you do with your doubts? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to think for a moment in order to apply this message always towards application. What is it in your life right now to acknowledge, you need to acknowledge, that's a real barrier to your faith? Let me parse that out for you. Maybe it's something that you keep on suppressing. I know people in our church who have had severe health challenges for decades. Maybe you've learned to live with that. Maybe your faith has grown through all of that. Maybe it's a sin of your past. Maybe it's habitual sin, even now. Talk to so many people, I don't even know if I believe. How can I be a Christian and be doing this thing over and over and over again? What is it for you? Maybe it's something you've done. What is it that you, maybe, it, maybe it's intellectual barriers that you have. Maybe it's moral issues, things from your past, and you can't get over them. What is it that you need to acknowledge right now by the Spirit that's a barrier to faith for you? Maybe it's something that's happened in the past. You know, recent reports of sexual abuse in Southern Baptist churches. Maybe you've been hurt by Christians or by the church in some way. You're having a hard time getting over it. I would say don't let it keep you from coming to Jesus. That hurt is real. Those kind of reports can conjure up the past for some of us, re-traumatize us in some ways. Maybe you've experienced evil in your life has come at you you're struggling to believe i want you to press into that today 
Don't let anything keep you from coming boldly to Jesus in this moment. Because listen, real faith battles. Real faith fights the fight. Real faith does not give up. And the fight, listen, the struggle is not against people or a person. That's where we get, we, we get it wrong. Yes, there are people who hurt us. But our faith is challenged because of principalities, ideas, feelings, tensions, disbelief, challenges. Those are the things we fight. That's the real fight. Faith is a fight. So what does it look like for you today to fight? Because for some of you, it means that you're going to bring it to someone else. I've already had two conversations today with people who said, I've got to talk to you about this. Others have come to, 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 to a small group or to a connect group. Some of you need to join a group in our church, a connect group. And you need to be diligent so that you enter into a relationship. Not just kind of swoop down, come in, worship with, with the larger church family on a Sunday morning. But instead, go deeper, be courageous, fight for your faith. Get involved in the church. Talk with others. Some of you need to go to a mentor, maybe to a pastor, to a friend, someone that you know. Last week, I talked to two couples in the Great Hall. After the service, we just referenced a um, challenge of, of infertility. Jay Miller did with, with his wife, Nicole, and he just told a brief story. Talked to two couples who were wrestling with infertility. Talked to a couple that came uh, in tears, saying, we just need help. We just need to talk to someone. And it took great courage just to do that. But do you know we got to pray over them? We told them about a group that meets in our church. I said, do you know there's a group in our church of young couples? No, we didn't know that. See, what happens is when you step through and you press against the doubts and the opposition, the challenges that you have in your life, what happens is you realize you're not alone. You start to feel like maybe I'm not an outsider. Maybe there are others who wrestle with this and that's what they came to realize. We got to connect it with some folks that they can talk to. So she faces opposition, but watch this. Faith may acknowledge opposition, that's the first step, but it endures opposition. Look at this. This story is amazing and confounding. Look at verse 23. But he did not answer her. What? So Jesus gives her the silent treatment after that. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, send her away, for she's crying after, out after us. It's like, well, I came to the pastor. He wouldn't listen to me. He didn't have time for me. Then I tried to go to one of his you know, followers, some of the leaders in the church. They, they're like, would you get her out of here? She's bugging us. Now, we don't know the tone. Could it be that he's saying, would you, would you just heal her and send her on? Because we're here for a retreat. Remember, we're trying to get away from people like this. This is getting messy. And a demonic daughter, this is going to get crazy. So could you just take care of this and press on? Let's, let's move on. But watch this. Real faith endures opposition. She is faced with silence from Jesus. And the disciples are going to misinterpret his silence. We often do that. Some of us are misinterpreting God's silence in your life right now. That's one of the great struggles you have. And you're doubting in a particular area of your life because God seems silent. What's going on? What is happening there? See, the amount of opposition to her faith increases as this story goes, as we'll see. But we'll see also, so does her faith increase. As the oppositions to her faith increase. She's silent. She is desperate. And even the disciples are saying, okay, we need to send her out. She's not getting any help. But then to make matters worse, when Jesus does speak, it becomes more challenging. Look at verse 24. He answered, I, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. What? He's saying, you're not a Jew. That's his answer. Now, again, we don't know the tone. See, the, the greatest challenge in this passage for the modern reader is a, an apparent lack of concern that Jesus has for this woman and for the daughter. What is happening? Part, part of the challenge of reading the printed word is we don't see the tone. I think what's happening here, Jesus is playing the role of the challenger. He's challenging your faith. And you might say, well, that's kind of odd. 
Why the Jew? He's saying that the house of Israel, Jews first. That's always been the, that's always been the story. That the, 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 the Messiah would even come out of the, the people, uh, the Jewish people. God would form a community. He would enter into covenant with them with the Ten Commandments. And out of that group would come the Messiah. And then the church would become the new people of God. And what's happening here is we're right on the precipice of that. It's, 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 his time has not yet come, but it's coming. And it's coming right here. Right now before our eyes and in front of the disciples right here. Because here's God's plan. He's always been forming a family. That's what he's doing. Then Israel becomes the prototype of that. And then out of that comes the church. The church is this new community for the whole wide world. It's opening up now, not just the Jews, but it's coming to the Gentiles, to pagans like this woman, like you and me. Any pagans here? That would be all of us, unless you're a former Jew. Okay? So we're all Gentiles, and it's come to us. But somebody needs to hear this today. God's always been forming a family. And if you're not a member, can I be so bold, of this church or a church, if you've been coming and you're not a covenant member with us as a people of God, you, you're out of the will of God. He wants you to be committed to a group of people who are following him, pursuing him. Why? It's always been his plan. His plan has never been, well, let me save that person. Okay, there you go. A little, little, okay, personal salvation over here. There is that, but okay, it's in there. And just y'all have at it. And No, he's forming a family. We're saved from sin and to community. And if that's a, a convicting word for you, that is an application for you today. Join the fellowship of this church. Come talk to us right after this is over. Because that is God's plan for you. But what is happening here? Let's press on. Is he, does he want the disciples to advocate for her? What, what is he, what's he doing? I'll tell you what's happening here. You ever heard of isometric training? Like resistance training? You know what that is? Iso, iso means equal and metric means measure. Equal measure, equal force. It'd be like me, but like I would do planks, but I'm not going to do it. It'd be like, like yoga does it. Like yoga or maybe it's a squat. It's where you freeze and you hold it right? You don't contract the muscle. You just hold it. It's like having something over your head for a long time. And, and, and it's, it's, it's how you build your muscle. You'd be pressing up against, you know, a wall. It's this equal and opposite reaction that creates strength. Isometric, watch this, isometric faith building means that you're pressing in constantly, but there's this opposition. There's this pressing back. This is what Jesus is doing. And you say, well, that's, that's not kind. Listen, Hebrews 11.6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Not improbable, not unlikely, impossible. If this is true, wouldn't every one of us want to be in some isometric faith building exercise all day long, all the time? Because we acknowledge the opposition that comes in our faith because it's real and it's constant. And it can create doubts, but we also acknowledge the fact that real faith endures opposition because we press on into it. It's not unlike a conversation I had with a guy where we were talking, and he, was, he wasn't a Christian, and I was talking, and he was angry, and he was one of these mad, you know, guys coming at me. He wasn't listening. I was trying to explain the gospel. He would have all these questions. Got underneath, like, hey, tell me your story. He has this personal story. Often that's the case. He was wrestling with a relationship with his dad from way back and he's just mad and his anger has gotten him in all kinds of trouble and he wasn't listening to me every every challenge i had thought well well thought out logical argument towards what he he was he'd come back and i just realized sometimes you, you're just they're just like that he's not gonna listen to me i was about done and i decided to change my strategy with him and i said you know what you may be right. With all that you've now confessed to me, all you've done, he was saying, you know, God is no loving God. Are you kidding me? And then if, if, if it is, he's not going to love me with all I've done. I said, you know, you might be right. Now, you've done a lot. And you may be right. Maybe God doesn't love you. Maybe you're right. Maybe he doesn't love you because you've done a lot. And it might be that he has just written you off. He doesn't love you at all. 
Maybe there's no hope. And he says, no, no, wait, wait, wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> what you were talking about, like this grace and all the stuff, you think maybe that's not like, like there's no hope for me, like for real. So you might be right. You may be right that there's no hope for you. you you're like, he, no, he didn't love you. There's no forgiveness. But hold on, wait, 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 just a minute, wait. Because if you're, if you, what you're telling me, he started arguing back to me the other way. The guy ends up leading himself to Christ. <laughs> True story. True story. This is what Jesus is doing. He's pressing back. Why? Because I knew that guy, if he's going to come to Christ, he's going to have to get there on his own. He's going to have to overcome some barriers. But he's, I can't convince him. The Spirit will convince him. Because real faith acknowledges opposition, endures opposition. Watch this. Finally, overcomes opposition. That's what happens here. As we will we'll land this now, and then we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper before we go. Look at verse 27. She said, yes, Lord, look at this. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And with this statement, Jesus says, look at this. Oh, woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And, and her daughter was healed instantly this woman's faith in who Jesus is overcomes all of her doubts I mean she completely accepts this new world view that Jesus is giving to her that he puts forward here and then she paints he paints a picture of the world where he is king he's the Messiah he's over all things he can even heal her her daughter she believes it and she completely accepts it and it frames her response to him what she knows is true about Jesus, she believes is true, dominates in her response. She doesn't get offended. She doesn't even come back at him. She didn't go back to her past. She didn't have all the questions. She just wants Jesus. The woman's faith is who and who Jesus is overcomes all her doubts. She accepts Jesus' valuation of her life, of his ministry, her place in history. And her faith overcomes not Jesus' reluctance, but the barriers that she had set up to come to faith in him. Jesus is constantly coming at you. Jesus is so great. She knows that even just the crumbs are enough. It's like the woman with the bleeding issue. I can just touch him. I can just get close to him. That would be enough. And if, if he's the primary source of all blessing in the world, and he is, then just the crumbs are enough. Which means then just a little bit of faith is enough. Because it's not your faith, ultimately. The amount of your faith that saves you. It's the reliability of the one, the trustworthiness of the Savior in whom you place your faith. He's the one who rescues us. And after this passage, Jesus will literally go on in chapter 15, verse 32, 39, to feed, to feed the dogs, literally 4,000 of them. But friends, here's the, here's the thing. Don't give up until you hear from the Lord. And you'll hear it over and over again. And then you'll slip back into doubt. But let's, listen, listen. Let him hear from you today. Great is your faith. Because you're here and you're pressing on. Saving faith is enduring faith. Don't give up. Do not give up. Because her story is our story. We're all outsiders. And even, even Paul says, 1 Corinthians 1, The cross itself is an opposition to our thinking. To our religiosity. To our self-righteousness. He says, to the Jew, it's you're asking for signs. It's a stumbling block. It's a scandal. To the Greeks, you want logic. You want rational understanding. Then you'll come to Jesus. He said, no, it's not that either. It, it's a third way, and it's the way of faith. Jesus requires faith, not works. Praise God, it's not up to you. It's what he's done for us.